Hey everybody, it's Jay Keck, the Habitat Education Manager for the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Uh, we have Dr. Robert Carter with us today, um, and I'm really excited to learn more about grasslands and prairies of South Carolina. Hey Robert, can you can you hear me? Or uh, give me a thumbs up if you can. All right, awesome. Um, I'm having trouble sharing my video, so when I interrupt you, you're just going to hear my <laughs> hear my voice. You won't see my face pop up first. Um, but uh, we let's let's hang out, hang tight, just for another minute or two before we start this. Um, and you know, I'd love to I'd love to hear y'all's uh, opinions on what kind of classes you'd like to see next. So um, in the chat box, if you don't mind, just uh, type what you know what what topic what topics you would like to to hear about you know in, in future webinars um these are being recorded so we'll pop these on our youtube um channel so if you can't um you know catch one you know check check them out on youtube um and make sure when you are typing something into the chat box that it's going to panelists and attendees just so folks can see your question if it just goes to panelists it's just going to to a couple people um, but make sure it's going to panelists and attendees so we all can see it. Um, ask your questions on the chat uh, through the chat box. Um, and I'll again interrupt Robert from time to time with those questions. Um, it's a cool topic. Um, grasslands, prairies, you know, who, who knew that we had so many in the past uh, in th throughout the southeast. Uh, I'm assuming uh, we'll, we'll all learn more together about this. Um, so please ask questions, um, please be interactive um, so we can kind of make this fun for Robert too. Um, and uh, I put the link for our auction, which starts this uh, Thursday on the chat box. So if you haven't registered, register. We have some awesome items uh, up for grabs. Um, my brother is cooking a personal, you know, forks, knives and spoon bills event. Um, I'm gonna be there as well. Uh, he's a chef down in Charleston. Um, I'm, I'm also leading a bird walk and he's going to cook lunch for us. Um, we've got a generator, we've got things at spas, we got all sorts of stuff. Um, so just, uh, just register, check out all that we have and, um, you know, support us. We can't, we can't offer these free classes without your support, um, and get into schools and, and, and put up 370, you know, prothonotary warbler boxes in the last two years without y'all support. So, uh, please support us. Uh, so we can keep on doing some good for wildlife. Um, I am going to, let's see, turn this over to Robert in just a second. Um, so Robert Robert uh, just kind of reached out to us last year, uh, late last year, and was wondering uh, if we could do anything together. Um, we talked about the prothonotary project, you know, installing prothonotary warbler boxes. Um, and then I, I can't remember how this, this topic came up, but I found out that he knew... Uh, he knew about this stuff and I don't, and I know a lot of folks don't. And so I wanted, I, I asked him and, and he generously said yes to do this class. So I am very happy about that. But um, I think I am going to, let's see, we are at 12.04. I'm gonna hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Carter. Um, please begin and thank you. And just make sure you're unmuted too. There you go. There it goes. It didn't want to cooperate there for a minute. <laughs> All right. So yeah, like like Jay said, I'm Robert Carter, and I, I live in Rock Hill, and I, I grew up here, hunting and fishing in uh, York and Chester County, and exploring all over South Carolina, and went to Clemson and got bachelor's and master's in forestry. And I did my master's research on the Nantahala National Forest, and then I I went to Auburn and did a PhD in forestry, looking at plant communities in South Alabama. So that was longleaf pine. And uh, then I worked at Mississippi State in the forestry department. And I worked at Jacksonville State University in the biology department for a really long time. And ironically there, there's a, uh, there's longleaf on the mountains there. So I studied, studied that a good bit, did a good bit of uh, research in uh, Pine Mountain, Georgia, looking at plant communities. And I've also done a lot of bird work, done a lot of work with uh, the Backman Sparrow. And then I decided it was time to move home. So I moved back to Rock Hill and I currently work for the Museum of York County 
and I also teach part-time at Clinton College and HBCU in Rock Hill. Now, I was growing up in Rock Hill, you know, I, I knew about, you know, blackjack, that was, it was a, a type of soil, and I knew there were lots of blackjack oak there, and it was just a, a different place, And but I didn't realize um, how important it is, and that at one time, most of the blackjack was grasslands. So I, I, my current title for this, this talk is Grasslands of Southern Enigma, because nobody knows that they really existed. So this, this is going to be um, a part, part of this is a history lesson, and then some of it's uh, ecology. And this picture right here is the uh, Rock Hill Blackjacks Heritage Preserve, which is one of the, uh, the best examples of a Piedmont Prairie that we have in South Carolina that's, that's still here. It, it's really small and it's right outside the city limits of Rock Hill. But it's, a, it's a really cool place. All right, let me see if this is going to cooperate with me. There we go. Now, so what is a grassland? Okay, so according to the dictionary, it's a landscape dominated by almost continuous cover of grass species. So when most people think of a grassland, they think of this picture here. This is the uh, tall grass prairie preserve in Kansas. You know, and the, the grass just goes on and on and on for miles and miles and miles. And you can see, the bison out here. There's some bison there, and there's a bison wallow where they wallow around. So that's grassland. Now, when we talk about grasslands in the southeast, it is a little different, but we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Another word we use for areas with lots of grass is a savanna. So a savanna is an open tree canopy with an understory of grasses and a seasonally dry climate. Okay, so that's that's the norm is it's seasonally dry. Like if uh, in Africa where you have these extensive herds of wildebeest, that's a savanna and it is seasonally dry. It's a seasonal drought basically. In the South, it's different. The South kind of breaks the rules when it comes to grasslands and savannas. So we'll talk about that. I took this at the Greenwood Plantation in Georgia. And this is one of the uh, last really uh, big, well it's a thousand acres intact old growth Longleaf Forest is a really cool place. So the grasslands in the south don't uh, meet the expected precipitation that you would find in a prairie or in a savanna. Like you go to our prairies in the Great Plains, you know, they might have 20 inches of rain a year and that's it. You know, we have a lot more rain than that. And can you go to uh, the, the uh, kind of the transition between the Eastern deciduous forest and the and the uh, the tall grass prairie. You get into the savanna area that's still there. The amount of rain is much lower than we have here. So the the grasslands in the south exist for different reasons. Part of it is geology. You don't have to read all this stuff on here. That's just reminders for me. Part of it is geology. We have areas where we have very shallow soil, so it's just really hard for an extensive tree canopy to develop. And that's what you have here in this picture from Pine Mountain, Georgia. That's where I did some research. Uh, so this is an open grassy area because this, the soil is just very shallow, very rocky. It was terrible taking soil samples there. And when I was doing research in this area, I actually had to order a field guide for grasses of the Great Plains because they were grasses similar to the Great Plains there. Then we have soils with these special characteristics, either the chemistry is really different or the physical properties can be different. We have soils that will swell when it rains a lot and then when it gets dry, they shrink and they crack. And anytime you have that shrink, shrink swell situation, it's hard for a canopy to develop because when it, it shrinks, it makes all these cracks, it's really hard on the roots. The soil chemistry oftentimes ends up being closer to a, uh, to a six or seven pH. And that's something else that will change the species that you find there. And then there's herbivores, large herbivores uh, consume young trees before they become established or uh, sometimes they break them down. And if you go back to the late Pleistocene, we had mastodon, mastodon and mammoth here, and they, uh, they would knock down the trees. 
Okay, so we're going to get back to uh, the Pleistocene a little bit. And then there's fire. You know, fire can have a huge impact on the ecosystem that kills really thin bark trees and prevents uh, seedlings from survival, surviving. So that can contribute to grassy areas. And then along, uh, along rivers, you had scoured floodplains where it would flood and you have this, all this water running through the floodplain and, and it would scour out the soil and knock down the trees and create these open areas where then river cane would get established. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. Uh, river cane is a really uh, kind of a, a unique grassland. People don't think of it as a grassland, but it is because river cane is a grass. So we're gonna hit on that some. So there's no extensive grasslands left in the South, unless you, uh, you consider some of the uh, longleaf pine areas that have been restored, but you can still find some. Uh, you go to the Black Belt and the Jackson Prairies in Alabama, Mississippi, and some of those still exist. A lot of it is farmed, but there's still pockets of it. We got the savannas and the flatwoods of the uh, Gulf and Atlantic coastal plain. That's primarily gonna be your, your longleaf ecosystems. Um, in coastal Louisiana and Texas, there are prairies. I mean, now they're just tiny, tiny little remnants of it, but there were, there were prairies. That's kind of that transition to the Great Plains. Then we have barrens, uh, where you have uh, soil conditions or, uh, or you might have geology that's a little bit different. Sometimes it's hard pan, where you have a layer of soil that's extremely hard, deeper in the soil. The roots can't grow through it, or there's shale barrens, there's limestone barrens. Anytime you get these different types of rocks, it creates different conditions. And you have grassy balds. Here you can see a, uh, one of these balds in the Appalachians. All these balds are in the Appalachians. There's a really small one here at Clingman's Dome. And then you have the cane breaks. Okay, and this here is, again, is the uh, Rock Hill Blackjack Preserve, which would be a, an example of a barren because it's created by soil conditions. So how do we know that these southern grasslands were once extensive? Well, it's because people wrote about it. They going back as, as far as 1540 when DeSoto came through the Carolinas, he mentioned uh, extensive Piedmont prairies and areas of agriculture. He also talked about these uh, extensive, extensive grasslands in the coastal plain. Okay, it wasn't in the Carolinas, but it was down in Georgia. You know, you know, and it all, all uh, moves <clears throat> moves up the, the coastal plain in the Carolinas. And in 1701, John Lawson traveled through the Carolinas. And you can see his path here. He went right through York County here, ended up over here in uh, North Carolina where he established New Bern. He published a book, it was published in 1709. I got it here, I'm reading it right now. It's A, a New Voyage to the Carolinas by John Lawson. It's a really great book. Kind of hard to read because you know he wrote in 1701 uh, English, but it's a it's a really awesome book. Can help you understand what it was like <clears throat> a long time ago. He talks about a lot of the uh, the Indian tribes, Native Americans that are now uh, extinct. Okay, then we have Mark Catesby, and he traveled through the Carolinas in about 1720, and he was a a naturalist. So he drew pictures. A lot of these early naturalists, they wrote about what they saw, but they also drew pictures. And here's an ivory, ivory billed woodpecker that he, he drew. And this is from his book, Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands. Really awesome book. I've never read the whole thing, but it's, it's really cool. Um, and he talked about bison, Descri described these large herds of bison on the Piedmont Savannah and how during the heat of the day, they were retreating the cane breaks and the cane breaks were just extensive. They weren't little, these little small patches we find now, they were really large. And he also talked about Native American using fire and they burned in the winter. Then we go to 1755, the governor of South Carolina, or at that point it was the Carolinas, James Glenn reported large herds of bison and extensive uh, savannas near Edgefield. It's actually uh, still a savanna over there. It's really small. It's a post oak savanna. It's on, it's on Forest Service land. Okay. 
And then we have William Bartram. Okay, he's one of the more famous uh, naturalists who traveled through the South. And he was different than a lot of the, the other explorers because he didn't uh, describe the natural hab habitats as a commodity. He described it more as like a true naturalist. So his, uh, his writings are, are really, really awesome. And this was in 1775, right there at the beginning of the, uh, the revolution. And he described these large grasslands he described it on the coastal plain and uh, some in the Piedmont. And there, there at the bottom, you can see that's Greenwood Plantation again. One thing that he did not describe in the Carolinas was elk, because Carolina, the elk in the, in the Piedmont was already eliminated. There were still some in the mountains, but they were eliminated from the Piedmont. So his book is really awesome. It is really thick, and it's just called The Travels of William Bartram. I used to make my I plan a college class to read this. And at the beginning, they loved it. And then by the end, they were like, why do we have to read this? Because he'll, he'll go, on a, go on a tangent. He'll just, for pages and pages and pages, he just lists scientific names and talks about them. So my <laughs> students awesome. got tired of that. Hey, but Robert, some of the stories great. in there are amazing. The man should have died. Hey, yeah, Jay, you got something? Yeah, no, I was just kind of curious, just so people can, and, and for myself too, I'd like to um, try to imagine what, what South Carolina and the Carolinas look like, but you know, what what was the most, I guess, abundant type of um, you know habitat like this? Was it was it just the grasslands, or was it the savannas? You know, were there more savannas with the trees in them, or was it more just just grass? You know, those grassy prairie fields. It was more savanna, especially in the coastal plain. That was almost all savanna until you got to the wetter areas. In the Piedmont, on the uh, uplands. It could be a savanna or a prairie, depending on you know the soil and how much fire it gets. Then we get into the mountains. You know the, the mountains are so highly dissected; it's really hard for fire to carry across the mountains. Hmm. So you didn't have as many grasslands. It was mainly the uh, the balds. Okay. Grassy balds. Yeah. Okay. But I, I mean, that's, Bartram will go on for pages and pages describing these extensive savannas and grasslands. Okay, I appreciate those books. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this is a really cool plant that he uh, he described and collected. It's Franklinia, uh, and it was along, along the Altamaha River in Georgia, and he collected some. And not long after that, nobody has ever found them in the wild again. So uh, we're not real sure what happened to them. We don't know if uh, people got excited about the plant and just went down there and dug them all up or, or what happened. But I have one in my yard. I, I found some random nursery in Alabama that had some. So I bought, bought a few and I got them planted in my yard. They're really awesome plants. And they're uh, related to the camellia, just not found in the wild anymore. All right, so why did these uh, grasslands decline so quickly? So in about, uh, I think I'm, it may have skipped a slide here. There we go, I thought so. Let me make sure to skip too. Okay, all right, so in some of these writings, uh, they will describe the Piedmont savannas being like, like 25 miles across. So they weren't little small things. And it was probably similar to what you see here, where you would have some open grassy areas, then you have some trees, then you'll go back into some open grassy areas. You can see the bison out here. This is that uh, land between the lakes where they've kind of restored the, uh, the savannas and prairies there. And, and in York County, the British Army did not like to come through here. York County has a lot of uh, areas with blackjack soils. So there, we know there were uh, grasslands and savannas here. The British didn't like to come through here because they would, it was so open. You know, They're like sitting ducks out there, especially when you walk in lines when you try to do a battle. And then by the 1700s, um, all the bison were extirpated. So by the late, late 1700s, we didn't have the bison anymore. Still in 1846, uh, in sketches of North Carolina, they described vast prairies and cane breaks. But then by 1850, most of the Piedmont was settled. And through time, as people would abandon their farms, especially after the Civil War, they, these are abandoned fields that were eroded. 
they regenerated as forest instead of grasslands. So then we, we lost our extensive grasslands. And the, the same kind of thing happened in the prairie. So this is uh, in Iowa, this is a remnant tall grass prairie. There's like, there's only 5% of our tall grass prairie left because we went in there and farmed it so quickly. Now there's no telling how many uh, insect species we lost when we, uh, when we went, went out there and just farmed these areas. All right, so why did they disappear so, so, so quickly? So it, in a matter of 300 years, you know, they were gone basically. Now, a lot of it goes back to land use, which is pretty common. A lot of people don't think about fire suppression. Okay? In the, you got to have uh, in the South where it's pretty wet. If you don't have fire, then an area will change from a grassland or a savanna to a dense forest pretty quickly. Okay? You, you, you got to have fire. That's, that, that's the difference between forest and grassland. And one way to think about it is when you have 10% human land cover in an area, so you got the human populations out there and they're farming or, or now, you know, we're building buildings, whatever you're doing, that leads to a 50% reduction in fire. Okay, so just having the people in there reduces the amount of fire, just a huge amount. Okay, when the Native Americans were there, you know, it was part of their culture and it was a little bit different with the settlers. So when you eliminate the fire and you're in a really uh, a subtropical wet habitat, you know, the forest came back very, very quickly. And you had eliminated some of the large herbivores, the bison and the, the elk were gone. So the grasslands and savannas just started to disappear. And trying to figure out what they were like is really tough because of, you know, we've had fire suppression, huge amounts of soil, dis soil disturbance. You know, we, uh, farmed everywhere. Uh, typically when you farm an area, you know, you wipe out all the native plants. And they have, sometimes they have a tough time coming back. Um, we, have, we have invasive species we've brought in, you know, and the, they outcompete our native, native plants. And then canopy closure. When the canopy closes and the sun can't get to the, to the ground, then you just, you start to lose a lot of your grassland species. So if you want to find these species today, you basically got to go to a few remnant prairies like the uh, Rock Hill Blackjack Preserve I showed you, or look along roads, ditches, and rights away. Okay, that's where you're gonna find them because they've been kind of maintained as an open habitat and not on purpose, you know, it just happened. Or you can go to a glades or a mafic barren. We're gonna talk about mafic in a few minutes. This is a barren right here. And it's got, uh, got some long leaf there. This is in actually in the middle of Birmingham, Alabama. There's a, uh, a state park there. And on top of some of the ridges, you have these kind of unique barrens. that are kind of grassy. So uh, a lot of our uh, Helianthus swansii, you can see a picture of them right up here, are now restricted to roadsides and places like the Blackjack Preserve. And so I get emails, you know, on a regular basis where they're, they're doing some work, you know, widening a road or something, and they got to move these sunflowers. So then they get a group of people with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they go out there and dig up the sunflowers and they move them someplace. Because that's where you find them. So now they're kind of restricted to these right of ways and, and roadsides. And, uh, and the same kind of thing goes for the prairies. Uh, if you ever read Sand County Albanac by Aldo Leopold, he talks about how if you want to find the prairie, you got to go to a graveyard or you got to go look along the road or the railroad. That's where you're going to find it. Everything else has been farmed. So the prairie is, is missing. Robert, can I ask you a question about the blackjack? Um, yeah. Place? So is, is that, is that the, a DNR heritage preserve? I just, it I just, is. Okay, okay, I just wanted yeah. to make sure I put a link uh, to that on our chat um, box and I put the land between the lakes as well. That those, those two places really look cool. So I just wanted to make sure I uh, chose the right spot and it was DNR property. Okay, yeah. And at the end, I'm gonna show you a website you can go to that shows the remnant prairies in the Carolinas and in the Piedmont that you can go visit. Awesome, thank you. All right, so. There's, a, there's been some, uh, some argument among uh, ecologists and historians about where the 
are these savannas and grasslands, were they here before humans or do they appear after humans? So we think humans have been in the Carolinas between 10 and 15,000 years. So you know, are these savannas here or grasslands here because the Native Americans burned or is it something else? But the, uh, these savannas and grasslands can be traced back to the end of the Ice Age. Okay, the end of the Pleistocene, when our climate was drier and it was, uh, it was a little cooler, but you could have frequent fire right, because it was dry and you still got some proximity to the ocean. You're still going to get some thunderstorms. So you're going to get some fire going through here. Uh, you had periods of drought. Because um, at the end of the Pleistocene, we were a little more like the prairie, our Great, great Plains, than we are now. So those savanna species and grassland species were able to move, move east. And then as the climate uh, got wetter, some of these grassy landscapes persisted because of fire. Um, also, you know, occasionally we get some drought and drought uh, really influences the blackjack soils because they shrink and swell. And you had grazing by, by large, uh, large herbivores like the, uh, you're in the Pleistocene, the mastodons and the mammoths were the grazers. As they disappeared, you still had, had the bison. Then later you had elk. We think the elk kind of came in a little bit later. We're not sure exactly how long the bison have been here. But bison and elk aren't going to be here unless there are extensive grasslands because that's what they prefer. They want to be in these grasslands because they can look around and they can detect their predators. So. Just them being here tells us that these grasslands have been around for a good while because the grasslands have got to develop and then the bison and the elk have got to move from more western areas into the south. And also the long history of grasslands in the south has, uh, is reflected in species richness and endemic species. Okay? And especially when you're talking about the coastal plain. So we're talking about richness, we're just talking about just the number of species that are present. And then an endemic is a species restricted to a specific region or habitat. And when you get to the coastal plain, there are a huge number of endemic plant species that only live in small areas. You know, an example is your Venus flytrap. That's an extreme example. Okay, but there's other examples like that. And in order for a species to become so highly adapted for a certain habitat, it has to be there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So that, that tells us that these, uh, these grasslands had to be here before, before humans. Humans may have helped expand the grasslands some by burning, but they had to be here before humans. And here's a nice elk. Uh, and this is from Land Between the Lakes. I didn't take this one. I had to, I've got pictures of elk from Land Between the Lakes and the Smokies, but I can't find it. All right, so a little bit more about endemics and, uh, and plant diversity. So in the coastal plain, there's a huge percentage of uh, endemic species, and most of them are grassland, grassland associated. In fact, there are 927 endemic species in the longleaf pine ecosystems. Okay, and there's only 87 in the Great Plains. Okay, so there's just huge diversity, huge number of endemics. So that tells us these grasslands have got to have been here for many, many, many years, way before humans. In fact, one third of the plant species in North America are found in our coastal plain, okay, the coastal plain of the uh, Atlantic and Gulf coastal plains. And a lot of that has got to be fire, okay? Because the fire has been going through the coastal plain for just thousands and thousands of years. I mean, since the Pleistocene, okay? And they find, uh, they find evidence, pollen evidence that shows that these grasslands have been here for a really, really long time. Because, you know, we don't have many lakes in the, in the east, natural lakes, but when they find them, they can dig down and look at the pollen records and figure out that, hey, these grasses have been here for a really long time. This is a, uh, a savanna in uh, Florida Panhandle. That's where I took that. Okay, so we can't ignore that Native Americans did contribute to 
our grasslands, especially in the Piedmont. Okay, and in the uh, coastal plain, you know, it's easy for the for the lightning to, to spread fires. And you don't have roads and stuff out there. You know, it'll the lightning will start a fire and it'll just go for days and days, weeks and weeks. Same thing could happen in the Piedmont if it's very dry. But we know that Native Americans really did help increase the Piedmont grasslands. And on these upland sites is where we probably had, or we're, we're pretty sure we had these extensive prairies and, and, and savannas. But they had to be there before Native Americans got here. So they had to be pockets of grasses there. And those grasses probably migrated to the Eastern United States during the Pleistocene when it was so dry and the prairie grasses from our Great Plains could come east, then they got isolated here and they evolved into a, in a different species. And in this, the uh, Piedmont, we have a special type of soil called a mafic soil and it's really dense clay for large amounts of iron and magnesium. And it shrinks and swells and it's got a pH of around, you know, between six and seven. Okay, so it's much different than our, our other soils that are in the, uh, in the Piedmont because they're more of a pH, pH you know, of three to four. And a lot of our remnant grasslands are, are in these mafic soils. So if we had these mafic soils that were established, you know, a million years ago is when it started, and then you have these uh, very unique properties. You got the, the grasses that are living there. Those grasses, uh, the mafic soils were kind of like a refugium for them. That's where they could, they could survive as the, uh, it got wetter here. And then when fire started appearing, whether it's by lightning or by Native Americans, it started to spread. So right here in this, uh, this picture, you can see where the alpha soils are located. Okay, a lot of our mafic soils are are in these, uh, these alpha soils, or, but then alpha soils also have a higher pH, you're more likely to find grasslands there. You can see where they're, they're located. Right in here is where you have the Blackjack Preserve. Um, down here, I know there's another uh, remnant grassland. And then this is showing a map of our shrink and swell soils. So these are more of our uh, Blackjack soils. And then when you get over here, you start getting into uh, some of the uh, the black belt of, of Alabama is starting over in there. But you got these shrink and swell soils. You can see right here, we have the black jack preserve, you got shrink and swell. And I know there's a remnant grassland right here. We have the shrink and swell soils. Right. So I just wanna talk about cane breaks for a few minutes because they're just so unique. And they're 99% gone. Um, you know, we find little pockets of cane breaks, but you don't find a cane break that's a mile long anymore. Just, just doesn't happen. And they were created by something that removed the canopy. And then they were maintained by fire or floods. So removing the canopy could have been Native Americans because they like to farm there, but it also could be fl from floods. Okay, so the trees get knocked out. You get some, uh, some grassland started in there, some cane, and then the cane will burn. I mean, it sounds like a uh, somebody's shooting guns when they're burning because they uh, have the little pockets of air in there and they, when they expand, they explode. It's really, it's really kind of cool. Um, and we, when we think about uh, our Southern tribes, Southern Native American tribes, they're really a bamboo culture. They use cane for so much. They use it for their housing, they use it to, to make their weapons, just so many different things. So that's enough, some more evidence of that it was just, cane was extensive in the South. And the bison like to feed on it, in fact, some of the Native Americans would intentionally burn the cane because when the cane would sprout back, the bison would like to go down there and eat it. Um, Backman's warbler was a cane specialist. Okay, and now, you know, there's debate over whether or not it's extinct or not. Um, if, it's a, if it does exist, it's very, very small population. You can see a picture here. I found one from 1958. I think the last confirmed sighting was in the 1960s. Somebody reported some in the Congaree National Park in the early 2000s, but I'm not sure that they ever confirmed it. Robert, can I ask you a question? Yeah. 
the uh, the blackjack oak is that is that why a lot of these places are, are called blackjack or is that why the blackjack oak is called blackjack do, do they only exist in those areas um they'll grow other places but when you get into the uh, blackjack soil it's uh, really hard for anything to any kind of tree to be there except blackjack oaks and some post oaks okay all right yeah i was wondering if there was a correlation hey and also um a folks were not able to um, type anything in the chat. That should be fixed now. So if y'all want to, okay. I saw some hands being raised. Um, so we figured there was a problem. So uh, you should be able to, to type your questions in the chat box now, just to let y'all know. Um, all right, Robert, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so uh, the, the river cane was just really odd. It depended on fire and flood and canopy removal. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect the fire to be there at the, uh, along the creeks and rivers, but it, but it was. So it's 99% gone. Uh, you can see a picture of one here, and this is what you normally find now, just a really little small pockets of it. And when I was a kid hunting in Chester County on the Sandy River, I mean, I would go, I would spend 30 minutes walking through a cane break. I didn't, I didn't realize how, uh, how significant that was, but it was a huge cane break. And I'm 12 years old going through this and it's eight feet tall. I can't see anything around me. Then I find a, a dead fawn and I'm like, it's half eaten. I'm you know, thinking, oh my gosh, some wildcat's going to kill me. But luckily I, I survived it. But now I wish I could go back to that cane break and realize you know, how important it is. And it, it may not even be there anymore. I don't know. But I, I, I'm getting into a, getting off topic here. But why did the cane decline? Okay, there's a, there's a, a lot of reasons. Um, and I think part of it might have been the passenger pigeon because the passenger pigeon would land in trees and they would break the branches. So then more sunlight could get to the to the forest floor on the floodplain. So that favored the uh, it's going to favor the the cane. And they also provided a huge amount of, of fertilizer. Uh, I've read stories about when the uh, passenger pigeons would roost in an area, just huge amounts of feces would be left. It was great fertilizer. Um, we have dams now, so we don't have many floods, not like we used to, and so we don't have that disturbance. We don't have the scour in there on the in the floodplain, not de not de depositing a lot of nutrients. Uh, then there's changes in agriculture. You know, a lot of our our agriculture is in the in the floodplains now, and then there's been the re reduction of fire. So there's just a uh, a lot of uh, factors have led to the decline of cane. All right, let me see if I can get this to cooperate with me. There we go. So as the eastern savannas uh, disappeared while the humans were disrupting the landscape and we uh, suppressed fire, I mean, it was a huge impact. We already talked about the river cane declined by 99%. Longleaf pine ecosystems in the coastal plain. And there's a little, there was, and there still is a little bit in the Piedmont declined by 97%. You know, there's been a big push over the past you know, 20 years to restore the longleaf pine. And I was, uh, I was there at the beginning of that. My advisor started the Longleaf Alliance while I was studying the longleaf pine in Alabama. Um, the Kentucky bluegrass ecosystem is totally gone. There's none of that left. I mean, you may find Kentucky bluegrass growing out there, but the ecosystem, it's just gone. You know, and we, we've lost our bison and our elk. And a lot of grassland birds have just really, really declined. I mean, a huge amount. Um, you know, we still have some grassy areas. You know, we have uh, we have pastures, but you know, it's not our native grass. A lot of these species need our bunch grasses to nest, and we we don't have a lot of those. A lot of the prairie is just you know whatever we planted out there. And a lot of these uh, grassland species tend to uh, avoid kind of small fragmented habitats. So, you know, we're not creating great habitat for them anymore. So, you know, we talk, talked about Backman's warblers dependent on the, uh, on the cane breaks, then like a uh, grasshopper sparrow, you know. I have a really hard time finding grasshopper sparrows because they, uh, they need these large open grassy areas, uh, longer head strikes, I, I rarely see them anymore. Uh, Horned lark, and 
I can't find one of those anymore. As a, an extreme example is Atwater's prairie chicken. See a picture of it right there. And they were specialists in the, uh, the prairies of Texas and Louisiana coastal plain. And I think there's only about 60 of them left. And there's just, the habitat just does, doesn't exist anymore for them. And while we're talking about the, uh, about prairie chickens, um, you know, we talk about uh, these uh, European explorers a lot, but we have evidence from Native Americans that these grasslands also existed. Because like the, the Cherokee have a word for prairie chicken. So I don't know why they would have a word for prairie chicken if it's somehow they didn't encounter it in their territory. They may have been referring to the heath hen because the heath hen actually got down into Virginia. It's now extinct. But that could be what, what they're referring to. But that's, that's more evidence that we had extensive grasslands and prairies, prairie type habitats in the south. And let me make sure that skip. Okay. A little bit about these Appalachian grassy bulbs because this is uh, it's really odd to get to a mountaintop and just see a prairie like you see here. And I didn't take this picture. This came from the Southeastern Grasslands web, website, which we'll talk about when I'm about done here. But they think these Appalachian bowls, like Roan Mountain is, the, is a well-known one, were probably created by a really cold climate. So almost like a, a taiga type climate. Okay, it, it Almost like a, um, a tundra, not quite a tundra, but they're pretty close. And then large herbivores, because you had mastodons and other other herbivores that probably grazed these bowls. So there probably wasn't much many trees there to begin with, because it was so cold and the uh, soil would would freeze so much. But then you had the mastodons come in, and mastodons they would uh they would feed on the trees, so that would reduce the number of trees. And then as the Pleistocene was ending, you know you already had deer, bison, and elk that existed during the Pleistocene. So they maintained these, these bulbs. Then when Europeans arrived, they brought their cattle, and then the cattle maintained the bulbs. And at one time there was this argument about whether these uh, bulbs were just created by domestic grazing, but the organic soil there is very, very thick. And organic soils that are you know, like a foot or more thick, they don't develop quickly, okay? so. In 300 years since the Europeans have been there, that's not enough time for about 12 inches of organic soils to develop. So this had to be going on for a very, very long period of time. And probably going back to the Pleistocene. Then I wanna talk about some of these uh, kind of adaptations that plant species have to deal with the environment of the South. So, the, our grassland species in the south and our, our savanna species are adapted to drought and fire. And much like our, the, uh, the prairie, our, our Great Plains, but here they need, uh, we've definitely got to have fire because it's still, uh, still we have drought, but it's still pretty wet here. And a lot of the trees in these, uh, these savannas are kind of contorted, they're kind of twisted. And if you're familiar with, uh, with blackjack oak, you know, it is always kind of contorted and twisted and it holds its dead branches. It's really a kind of a gnarly, nasty looking tree. And it's also nasty to work in. When I, I do field work in it, it's hard to tell right here, but this is a, a little savanna and it's got some uh, post oak and blackjack oak in there. But when I work in these habitats, you know, the, uh, a lot of the branches will, the tips of the branches will die and then it just stays on the tree. And they're all, you know, the, branches are all twisted around and it just, when I work in there, I always get cut up because the, uh, the, the branches are just so tough. And a lot of these uh, woody savanna species will re-sprout, you know, our oaks re-sprout very quickly. And also uh, shortleaf pine, it's one of the few pines that will sprout from a stump. And that is probably the pine that dominated in the Piedmont. We don't have that anymore for a lot of reasons, but shortleaf pine probably dominated as a pine. It was not the loblolly that you see today. And a lot of our warm season grasses are bunch grasses. You can see an example right here. This is the broom sedge, Andrew Pogon. They have really deep roots, and so they can get to water that's deeper in the soil. And 
their meristem, which is where they where the growth comes from, is down here at the bottom. It's protected by all this dead grass down here. So when a fire comes through, it, it may burn everything that's up here. But right there at the at the surface of the soil, doesn't get as hot. That meristem's got some protection. It's just going to sprout right back. These bunch grasses, when they dominate the landscape, also may make it easier for species like the uh, grasshopper sparrow or for the uh, or for bobwhite quail to find a place to nest. Or backbench sparrow, I know, is a is a specialist with these types of grasses because they'll build their nest between these uh, clumps of grasses, bunches of grasses. And most of our North American savanna is going to be dominated by oaks. Okay, so it's much different than what you would find in places like Africa. All right, so if you want to restore grasslands, the first step is to find some old grassland, if you can. Now, if you can find an old grassland that still has some of the correct species there, then you can manage that. Uh, you can start to thin it out some, remove some of the trees, get some fire in there. And through time, it's possible it may, uh, may naturally start to uh, regenerate. Because an area that has the native grassland species mixed with some pasture grass that's been planted, that may be a little different challenge and may have to use some herbicides to get rid of the pasture grass. You have to pick the right herbicide. There are some that will kill the pasture grass and aren't so hard on the native species. If you find areas where you, from historic records or something, you know was a grassland, like if you find blackjack soil, there's a good chance it was a grassland. So then you can try to work towards uh, restoring that area through management and probably have to plant some of the native species. But then you'd be surprised. Some areas, if you remove some of the canopy and burn, you know, plants just come back. I've done a lot of pitcher plant research and you go into areas and you think there would be no pitcher plants there, you can't find any, you thin it, you burn it, and all of a sudden pitcher plants pop up. So that could happen. But one important thing to do is try, try to get a, a seed source that is local. Now you can buy commercial seeds for, for the Southeast, but local is better. If you can find a natural grassland that still has some of the, the native species there and collect some of those species and plant them, that's awesome. It's a tough challenge, but it can happen. Or you can order them. I'll, I've ordered some um, from a commercial company and uh, I planted in my yard just because, you know, I'm kind of strange that way. I want the, the native stuff in my yard. I'm not sure what my neighbors think about it. We, we don't think that's strange at all, by the way, Robert. Oh, okay, well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure everybody on here is, is right there with you. Um, and, and, you know, one of, the, one of the questions I'm sure people have is, uh, you know, Kent, is, is it worthwhile doing this on a quarter of an acre? You know, a lot of people don't have, you know, 50, 100, you know, 500 acres to do this on. Um, you know, and a lot of people can't burn on their property because of the neighborhood or, or the subdivision that they're in. Um, you know, is it worthwhile um, trying to restore just a little bit on your property, whether that's, you know, like a 30 by 30 foot square? Um, is, is that beneficial for wildlife? Yes, the insects will really appreciate it. It's great for the insects. Yeah, and if you can't burn, you know, just occasionally mow it. I mean, okay. you don't, and you don't have to mow the whole area. You can mow parts of it at different times. And you're kind of, a, you're mimicking kind of mimicking a, uh, a bison when you do that, because they would go through and munch it. They wouldn't munch it all, but they would munch part of it. And when you run your lawnmower over that, you know, you're, you're taking it down to the ground like the bison would do, and then it'll sprout back. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's worth it. That's great. That's great. And, and, you know, you were talking about cutting trees down. I, I know it's kind of tough sometimes to cut those beautiful oaks and, <laughs> and hickories and, and maples down. But, you know, if you want to do this, you're, you're kind of adding a, a, a variety of, of habitat that you didn't have before, which could increase the biodiversity on your property. So really, really consider that if you do have enough, enough property for it. Yeah, a lot of our, uh, you know, our maples, naturally there weren't a lot of those on ridge tops 
And we've had what we call the mesophytication of the south, where we've eliminated fire and all these species that, would, that lived farther down the slope where it was moister have come uphill. So naturally you would have more oaks on your, on your ridge tops and not as many maples and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, but here's an example of, of a nice uh, grassland. And this is at the uh, South Carolina Botanical Gardens and they restored this. And I'm pretty sure they found an area that had never been farmed and it still had the natural soil there. You know, the soil here used to be a foot or more deep. The A horizon was a foot or more deep and they found an area like that. And they've expanded on it and created nice, uh, nice grassland there. Then I just want to show a few pictures of some grasslands that we don't really think of as being grasslands. Like this is on the coastal plain and this is getting, uh, this is right at the coast. You know, we get into these uh, huge marshes at the coast and they're, they're grasslands. Um, they're different than our savannas or our, our prairies, but they're important. And there's uh, specialists that depend on them. Okay, you've heard about how they're important for our, you know, for seafood, but also, you know, there are so many, so many uh, bird species that depend on this, like Sora and all the rails. So it's really important for that. These aren't maintained by fire. They're going to be, be maintained by, you know, the brackish conditions, which is really tough for, uh, for plants to live in. Hey, Robert, we had a question about sweet gums. Do you have a yeah. time for that? Um, <laughs> you probably get that quite a bit. So we had a question that says, my field is inundated with sweet gums. Is there any way to kill them besides burning? She's tried uh, pulling, but there are hundreds of them. You're either going to have to burn it frequently, uh, use herbicides, or you just mow it, mow it to keep them from taking over. I mean, they will take over if you let them. You gotta do something to knock them back. Yeah, they're uh, they're one of those species that has moved out of the floodplain and up onto the hills. Well, and when you when you talk about herbicides, I know a lot of people get scared. You know, with uh, about using those. Um, you know, are is there room on you know our properties for herbicide application? Should we be worried? Um, I would just be careful with it. You know, I don't like herbicides. But if I have Bradford pear coming into my prairie, I'm gonna use some herbicides because it's got to, got to go. So you just gotta uh, gotta make some choices there. If you have other alternatives, use them. I would try to use uh, herbicides as my last last option. But you know, sometimes that's just what you gotta do to knock the stuff back. And then from there, you can mow or you can put goats in there or you know whatever you need to do try to keep some of these uh, these species out of there. Some of the woody species that you don't want. Thank you. Yeah, you can bush hog. Uh, yeah, just make sure you don't disturb the soil too much. And here's another grassland. This is a barren. Um, I'm not sure where this, where this one is. I know it's in the Piedmont. And I've been to several places like this. Um, reminds me of 40 acre rock, but that's what this is. This is 40 acre rock right here. And, you know, there's there's areas of grasslands in here. I mean, you see really small areas here, but there are some uh, some bigger areas of grasslands at 40 acre rock. And that's in Kershaw County, I believe. It's right there where Kershaw and Lancaster come together. And it's, I get confused because the town of Kershaw was in Lancaster County, but then there's Lancaster County because the town of Kershaw, I think, seceded from Kershaw County a long time ago. That's another story. Okay, so if you need to get a hold of me, there's two ways. I work for the Museum of York County, and I have a, an email there, and also teach at, uh, at Clinton College, where I'm a uh, professor of biology. I mean, you'd think I, I could capitalize college, but I didn't. So my, my email there is pretty easy to remember because it's rcarter at clintoncollege.edu. <laughs> But the, uh, the museum, if you can remember, chmuseums.org, and you can contact me there. Um, and this is a, uh, right here, this flower, the, the Coreopsis tinctoria, is one that you would find in grassland areas. And when I, I went to the Black Lamp, Blackjack Preserve like two weeks ago and got out of the car and right there at the parking lot, I, I saw this. 
I didn't see many sunflowers out there. Um, I know they're not blooming now, but they should be growing, but could be the deer are munching them. The deer will uh, be really harsh on, on the sunflowers, on swamps of sunflower. Okay, now I wanted to show you this Southern Grasslands Initiative website. And if, when I click on this, if it doesn't pop up, on the screen, Jake can let me know and I might have to uh, share another screen because sometimes Zoom does that. So let's see what happens. It's trying. Okay, I did it twice. Okay, can y'all see that? Can you see that, Jay? It, it hasn't done anything yet. It looks like okay. it might have been, been thinking, but yeah, so far, no. Okay, um, here. And if and if it doesn't work, we can always just oh there it goes. All right, good job. I had to share a different screen. So this is where you go to find out information. The Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, and this was started by someone at Austin P University in Tennessee. But it's got lots of great information. And if you click on this over here in the right hand corner, let's see what projects, click on projects. And one of the projects is the Piedmont Prairie Partnership. So if you go there, it's got a nice video about restoring the, uh, the Piedmont Prairies. Just a little bit of information about uh, some background information there. And then the really cool thing is they show you where to go to find some of these prairies. Like right here, this should be, yeah, the Rock Hill Blackjack is right there. So what is this one? I think that's Clemson. Yeah, that's the uh, Botanical Garden at Clemson. And this should be the Post Oak Savannah. Yeah, on the Sumter National Forest. So you can go to go visit these places. It's, it's really cool. Um, you know, looking at pictures is one, one way to, to deal with this. But I mean, really, you need to go go check these out. And then one last thing I want to do is show you this video that I did with the Museum of York County. Okay, and let me, uh, let me share this one. Let's see, I think it's, yep. Yeah. Okay, so this is at Brattonsville, which is uh, just south of Rock Hill. And it's a, uh, it's a Revolutionary War village is basically what it is. But it's been there you know, since before the revolution and there's all the old homes are there. And this is the old pasture. And this is one of the places we've been planting. This wine is his sunflower when we have to move them. And I have my suspicions that this uh, probably has been a grassland before the settlers got there. So let me see if I can get this to play. There we go. Early explorers came to the Carolinas and went back to Boston to show they found vast open prairies and scattered trees, which is this place all of the Savannah. So the Piedmont was much different than what you see today. It was pretty open, scattered trees in many places, a lot of grassland, a lot of prairie. And through time, we have lost that. Some of it is because of development, some of it is because we don't burn on a regular basis fires to help reduce the number of trees and increase the, the grassland area. So now we have little scattered pockets of the prairie, remnant prairie. Sometimes you even find it on uh, all the roads. You'll find some of these uh, the prairie species. Or the power line right away is going to find prairie species. And in these prairies, you now find some endangered species. One of those is plants of sunflower. And it's much different than the western sunflower that you are used to seeing. And this is a, a smaller flower, still yellow, but kind of similar to a, a western sunflower. It's just a much smaller version. And notice that it has purplish stem. And the leaves always come out at right angles. At the tip of the leaf, 
curves and things. So what you're looking at here, this is an area where sunflowers that would have been lost due to construction on the road bill, they are moved to this area. So they're providing a, a, a refuge for them. And in the process, we're trying to recreate the prairie that was just so common to the people. So what you see here, what you hear in this area is much more similar to what you would have seen in the 1750s. This is a lot of the other people have. So the squirrels that travel from the East Coast to the Mississippi River and never touch the ground. This is just not the case. We had extensive areas of grasslands in the Piedmont, and there are efforts to try to restore some of this to maintain these species that are now becoming. So in the, our very rest, restoration project here, we need to go through and inventory climate for sunflower because it is an endangered species. Okay, the rest of this is just showing me um, inventorying sunflowers. So you probably uh, don't care about seeing me walking through there, running a transect, counting sunflowers. So, but that's all I've got. Um, here is the, uh, the link to the video and I encourage you to go to the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative and check that out. And um, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. Well, you know, Robert, I know a lot of people, you know, want to kind of recreate what they can on their property. Um, and you had mentioned seeds. So if someone can't go out and, you know, harvest their own seeds um, and they might not even know what they're harvesting. Uh, to begin with, um, you know, where do you have a kind of go to place where you like to get um, southeastern seeds from somewhere local or does one exist? Local um, for seed is kind of tough. Yeah, I, I got mine from uh, American Meadows. You can get them from Roundstone is another company. Mm -hmm. but actually, sometimes I just show up at the farmers co op and you'd be surprised how many cone flowers I found there. And I find other native stuff, you know, and I, I have to be careful. Sometimes it'll say native and I'll look at it and I know it's not native. I mean, just somebody has made a mistake. But okay. if you look, oftentimes you can find some of these native species at your, just like your ag, ag co op. Um, and there are some nurseries that specialize in native species. I've, there's one close by here I've gone to, and that's, I've got a little prairie in my yard. Do, do you know what that one's called um, in your in your area, the nursery? Um, Carolina Heritage, I believe. Cynthia Spratley can can help me out if that is not right. Oh yeah, also I forgot the, the Native Plant Society has a uh, a seed exchange. Yeah, I think it's Carolina Heritage okay. Nursery is the one that's it's in Waxhaw, North Carolina, but it's not yeah, far from Rock Hill. And Karen down, she must be in, in the low country. Roots and Shoots is a really great place, I think, in the West Ashley play, uh, area, and, and they really um, are focusing on native plants. Uh, here in the Midlands, we have uh, Wingard's Nursery, who does a pretty good job, and then we also have Mill Creek uh, Greenhouse, um, and they have you know, really, really strong um, selection of native. So yeah, I, I, you know, in the Rock Hill area, uh, I wasn't too familiar um, with uh, with any nurseries up there. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah, Carolina Heritage, uh, looks like Cynthia in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Um, look on Facebook. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, and, you know, to recreate and, and for the benefit of wildlife, or do you have, you know, a top two or three plants that, you know, are must haves for, you know, folks that are recreating um, or trying to construct something on their own property? Hmm. Well, you, <laughs> you need some grasses, um, like some of the andropogons are good. Uh, could you, could you, what's the, what's the common name for that? Oh, Broom sedge. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Some broom sedge, y'all. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I like a lot of the uh, the cone flowers and uh, some of the helianthus species um, and some of the mints. I mean, I've got some in my yard and it's just unbelievable how many pollinators I have. And now that, now that I have all these pollinators, I have all these dragonflies are coming in because you know, they want to catch the pollinators and eat them. So it's, just, it's really awesome to watch. 
And, and so the helianthus are, are the sunflowers, correct? Sunflowers, yeah. Okay, so and, it, and, and there's the, the native ones, you know, is, is what, you know, uh, Robert's talking about. And then, you know, some of the mints that you're you're talking about, I'm assuming you're talking about the, uh, I, I can't ever pronounce it, the pignanthemums? Pignanthemum, yes. Yeah, and they are fantastic, guys. So if they're, you know, top, in, in my opinion, it, they're in the top three. So we just created a, a pretty big pollinator garden at Chapin Town Hall, and the the pignanthemum muticum is by far blowing everything else out of the water in terms of how many bees, wasps, uh, butterflies it, it's attracting. Um, so, you know, they have flexuosum, which kind of, you know, stays a little bit, bit more bunched up, you know, it's kind of more controllable, but the muticum is, you can pull it out, you know, if, if it starts, you know, spreading, which it will, but, um, I'll put the name here on the chat box in just a second, but they are wonderful, wonderful plants, um, for the pollinators out there. And do you know, uh, Robert, if they were, if they were common in, in the grasslands or the savannas that we used to have here? The, the mountain mints or the mints? We don't know for sure. Um, sure. I mean, we know that Native Americans used them. So, um, uh, you know, they, they probably were there, but not positive, I, I don't know. And I like a lot of the uh, the goldenrods too. So, you know, I have flowers all the way up to, to frost. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna pop that name here on the chat. So there's the, Pignanthemum muticum, but there's also flexuosum, but just, just put in pignanthemum and some others will come. Yeah, uh, Cynthia says asters. So when we're talking about planting natives, you know, we're always thinking about, you know, the caterpillars and, and the insects that we're, we're supporting. So, you know, asters, goldenrod are some of the best in terms of how many they support, you know, how many caterpillars can can digest those chemical components in those, in those plants. But yeah, grasses, before I got into birds, I didn't know the grass was, you know, eaten by caterpillars. So you know, the broom sedge that Robert mentioned, you know, it's eaten by caterpillars. So the more caterpillars you're going to have, you know, we're always preaching, the more birds you're going to have. So if you want to see more birds, plant, plant some of these and, and, you know, have some variety in your habitat at your, on your property, if you can, you know, if you've got five acres of forest, maybe, you know, uh, you reduce some of that and, and get you some of this stuff that Robert's talking about now. And then Ivy Rice has her hand up. Does you still have a question? You should be able to, to type in um, uh, a question in the in the chat now, Ivy. We'll just kind of hang out just for a second. Anybody else have any um, any questions that you can pop in the in the chat box? Give it a few more seconds here. How the heck do you spell that mint? Yeah, hey, listen, I wish it was just, I wish the Latin name or the scientific name was just mint, but it's not. <laughs> it's one of the harder ones, but you know, you'll get you'll get used to it. Um, but yeah, the, it's it's right there. We'll we'll put a in an email, we'll also list some some of the plants that we're talking about, the the sunflowers, uh, the coneflowers, um, and some of the grasses. So um, we'll send it out to all the participants. Um yeah, bee balm is a good one. That's another yep. mint. Yep. Uh, we have 10 acres of woods and one open meadow prairie floodplain, so never too small if it can get full sun. Hey, 10 acres is great. Um, yeah, those all those little prairies and meadows, uh, you know, they, they, they help our pollinators. Um, well, listen, I, I appreciate everybody uh, joining us. Um, Robert, thank you so much. It's, it's a topic that I think more and more people need to... Uh, or, or, or wanting to learn uh, about. And, um, you know, I think in my opinion, people need to know about it. Um, it's interesting um, to, to, to learn about what was here before, <laughs> before we were. Um, and I appreciate you sending or shedding some light on that. Um, anything else that you wanna, you wanna add? I don't think so. Just get out there and plant some natives. Yeah. If you have any questions, try to contact me. Okay, and you can also email me too if, if uh, none of your questions were uh, or you didn't get to ask a question, just email me um, at j at scwf.org. Um, and if I can't help you, I'll uh, get in touch with Robert and we'll get a um, get an answer over to you. And Robert, you know, I'm thinking about that blackjack, that, that Rock Hill Blackjack uh, Heritage Preserve up there. And I know we were talking about 
you know, kind of itching to talk to people face to face. So maybe, maybe that's a future walk. I don't know. I'm just kind of planting the seed, so to speak right now. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great walk. Hey man. All right. I've never heard of it. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I, I can't wait to explore it. Uh, hopefully with you. Um, thanks All again right. for, uh, for doing this. And uh, thanks again, everybody for joining us today. We appreciate y'all. All right. Take care, Robert. Thank you. See you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.